everyone, this is Larry Chen. Welcome to my YouTube channel. We got my good friend Steve Wong here from Big Steve Racing and he brought out his amazing EG6 time attack car, also built for the Optima Ultimate Streetcar Challenge. How are you today? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is such a cool build and I've been following it since you started getting into it, but um, there's just so many things that I wanna dig into. But first of all, I've known you for many, many years. You've been in the industry, you've been part of the drift community. You were also a Daijiro Yoshihara spotter for many years, correct? So yeah, like you said, you know, we've known each other for quite some time, right? You've been wanting to feature the car for quite some time and I've said no on multiple occasions, but I think it's finally worthy of showing up to your garage. And yeah, like you mentioned, we've both been in the drift community for quite some time. Uh, I was able to spot for die for about five seasons and, you know, it's kind of neat to be able to bring you something that's that's not a drift car. <laughs> yeah, no, that's super cool. And um, we'll get into it later more, but you were a car show guy for a long time. Now you're not a car show guy, you're a go fast guy, but you also recently started working at Titan 7 Wheels. Yeah, correct. So uh, I came from a motorsports background from the last 10 years, helping with a drift program. And uh, I've kind of wanted some changes in life and now I'm with Titan 7. Um, they're a fully forged wheel company that's been around since 2017. Uh, so it's pretty exciting to be able to be on board to help their marketing events. And as you can see, we have a prototype set on my car now. Yeah, so from what I understand, Titan 7, their motto is Forge for All because they're building forged wheels that are not aesthetics first. It's more performance, lightweight, strength, all of that first. Correct. So you'll see a lot of our product isn't necessarily at uh, car shows or meets a type of that sort. Uh, a lot of our stuff is grassroots motorsports focused. Uh, so you'll see a lot of us at Beamer Challenge, Honda Time Attack Challenge, and even my own car at Grid Life grassroots type events as well too. So. Outside of myself, the partners that are at uh, Titan 7 have years and years in industry. So they're able to take a lot of their knowledge to be able to build a strong wheel that's structurally sound to be able to you know, take the abuses with you on track, hitting berms, hitting curbs, going for those fast times and cutting corners to be able to have a strong product. So essentially that's why we're forged for all, so. Mm -hmm. And then um, part of that is the manufacturing process then? Correct, so each of our wheel is used, uh, manufacturing process is a 10,000 ton press. So we actually have a product video showing our manufacturing process and how the wheel is actually made as well too. So that's able to put a lot of technology into it, you know, rigid spokes to be able to withstand all that abuse because. Yeah, and let's talk about this wheel in particular. Is this a square setup? Yeah, so this is the TD6 prototype on this. Uh, obviously the tooling prevents us from doing a certain width, but this is a 16 by seven plus 32. Um, so it's a prototype that we're kind of putting on my car to be able to get out there and do some marketing to also put it through its paces, right? To be able to see if, hey, do we want to entertain this market? Because if you guys do know, we're really popular in the A90 FK8 market because we do have a 10.7 setup for that. So be able to maximize the width and also the tire to be able to clear suspension pieces too, so. It's pretty rare in this day and age for a wheel company to come out with a new wheel for this application for older Hondas and also of this size. This is a 16 by seven, what's the offset? Uh, 32. So obviously, you know, um, with me coming on board, I said, hey guys, uh, I have a little bit of an older vehicle and selfishly, I want something for myself and we were able to create this. And how much, or what, what does this weigh? This particular setup is about 16 pounds. Um, this is just the wheel itself. I actually did not weigh it with the tire, but, um, compared to what I had on here, it was probably about five pound difference. And they look great, I love it. Uh, so what did you build this originally for? Uh, so if you actually look at it, it's a little bit of everything. Um, I competed in Optima Ultima Streetcar in uh, 2020 and 2021. So that's why if you look at it, there's a lot of aesthetics, a lot of um, race type products that are on there too. And one of the big things for Optima Ultima Streetcar is they have a d &E, which is called design and engineering. Uh, that's where they score the vehicle and you get four minutes to talk about your car. So it's basically a, a moving car show. Uh, so if you notice, there's things like suede door panel inserts, uh, suede headliner. I have two 10 inch subwoofers in the trunk because it's just things to score more points on. Um, so it, it's, it's literally a, uh, show car that goes onto the track. Hence the name Ultima, Ultimate Streetcar 
challenge, right? Yep. Because if you had a street car on street tires that was fully gutted and it was faster than every other car at the competition or um, at Optima Street Car Challenge, then there, you actually won't win because you would get deducted points for not having stereo, not having interior, maybe not as aesthetically pleasing. Part of it is because the key word is street car challenge, not gutted race car challenge. Correct, like you said, it's ultim uh, Optima Ultimate Street Car. Uh, so if you notice, like a lot of the panels here are covering a lot of the factory metal. Uh, one of the big things I noticed when I first started competing is that having exposed OE metal actually is a points deduction. Uh, so that's the reason why we went with the rear seat delete, went with subwoofers to make everything really aesthetically pleasing, so. Mm. And of course, you know, the car show side of, side of me is add some suede, add some color into it to make it look nice, so. So you, this is actually not what you're known for in the industry. You were actually a car show guy Correct. for a long time. And I think you, for the longest time when you were telling me that you were getting into this kind of driving and racing and building, you said that you wasted all your time before going to car shows, building VIP cars when you could be driving fun cars like this because it's not about going fast and having all out speed. It's about having fun at the track and really having a lot of time, um, seat time. Yeah, it's funny you say that, right? Uh, 22 years in the industry now, and, and I think the, the first decade and a half is spent doing car show type stuff. Um, as you mentioned, I had an LS400 as all VIP. Actually, I still have the vehicle. Um, and then the autocross road racing bug kind of bit me five, six years ago. And, and this is kind of the end result right now. Um, I wouldn't say you wasted your time. I would say that you kind of were steered the wrong direction. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, to each his own. If you want to do VIP cars all day, that's fine. But I'm glad that you're you're getting into the go fast cars. Uh, this has been to a lot of tracks all over the U.S. Uh, so yeah, like with Optima Ultimate Street Car, it's a typically seven to eight round series. There's a West Coast, a Midwest, and a East Coast type stuff. Uh, so I've gone from Las Vegas Motor Speedway to Utah Motorsports Campus to Button Willow to Big Willow. Um, just, you know, all around tracks that are on the West Coast that are super fun, so. You also took this to the SEMA show to compete. Yeah, so this went to SEMA last year, um, and that was the first time that Optima was able to do one of their segments at SEMA itself in the bronze lot. So it was pretty neat to be able to put the car together in this stage as you see now to drive in front of the SEMA crowd, which are all car enthusiasts. The challenge that we did was a start-stop challenge, which is timed. So basically it's a eighth mile, uh, down the line, make a U-turn, stop into a stop box, and it's timed. And every time I came streaming into that box, a bunch of tire smoke, you could hear everyone kind of cheering on and clapping their hands. So it was really exciting to be able to do that in front of a crowd, so. All right, well, let's dig into the build. So exterior-wise, you have the wrap. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of body panels? So this is a C-West aero kit that you see, uh, charge speed fenders. So the front bumper itself is modified too to make it look more like a drag look. Usually there's a uh, arrow hole on the outside where you see the Moto and Yokohama sticker, but we would fill that in to kind of give it a, a different look. Uh, it's a zero factory fiberglass hood that's vented. And this, so how much wider is this versus stock? Uh, this is about 30 millimeter wider. So it's funny because they actually call this the uh, D1 spec, which I believe references to drifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. So it's pretty neat because obviously, like you said, I have a little bit of a drifting background, so. Right, and so you have a, a fiberglass hood yep. vented. Yep. This is functional. Yep. It's also way lightweight compared to the stock, right? Correct, it's, uh, I didn't get a chance to weigh, but it is a big weight reduction. Um, we have some hood pins on here just in case uh, high speed stuff that it kind of pops open. We don't want to break the windshield, so. You got carbon fiber side mirrors. Yep. Uh, APR um, mirrors. These are also C West side skirts. Um, so typically they come up onto the fender, but because I have a wide fender on here, we had to modify this to be able to fit. And it just so happens we nailed down the, the the actual aesthetic of it to be able to match the fender quite well. So if you kept the stock fenders, you wouldn't have this 
fitment or you wouldn't be able to run this wide of a wheel? Um, well, obviously we have some spacers in the front and also because I went with the 5x114 setup on this, it will run the spoon monoblock calipers. The track is brought out just a little bit as well too. So. Oh yeah, so let's talk about that. So spoon, you had a chance to work with them on these. Uh, how does it feel with these? Uh, so the spoon monoblock uh, still utilizes all the factory type stuff, uh, even though I have an upgraded prop valve, 4040, uh, 15 16th master cylinder. The brake feel on this is really great. Um, I actually have to learn how to drive the car all over again because I'm stopping 50 feet earlier than I'm used to. Uh, the great part about the spoon monoblock caliper is it also uses like a S2000 uh, brake pad. So, you know, it's one of those where when you're at the track, you never know what will happen. You'll be able to get a replacement because it's a factory brake pad. So. so how does this compare to what you had before? I mean, do, is, do you have to um, adjust the bias with these because you don't have spoon rears? So with this setup here, um, I have to be able to learn to brake a little bit deeper. Um, I used to brake a certain way with this car, but now with this brake setup, um, I'm able to go a little bit deeper into the corner to be able to carry more speed into the corner. Uh, we moved to the rear of the car, and actually, mm -hmm. since we went five lug on this, mm -hmm. this is a custom um, brake setup. So if you actually look at factory cars, the rear brake caliper is on the back side of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm re engineering went ahead and custom made a bracket for me to be able to wheel, run a wheelwood rear. Mm -hmm. um, so in my driving, uh, I like a little bit more rear brake bias, so this actually helps balance the car out quite a bit when I'm coming into corners. So. And part of it is because it's front wheel drive, it probably helps to ro rotate. Correct, right? correct. Yeah, because I can get into a corner, jab the brakes, get the rear end to come around, and then get back on throttle too. So. Mm -hmm. All right, um, what other aesthetic things can we talk about here? What about the rear bumper? Uh, rear bumper is C-West as well too. And we went with a uh, Gretti turn down tip on here, and it's a custom exhaust system from IMA Engineering as well too. So. Um, of course, like every JDM guy out there, I have a Spoon Sports duckbill wing um, that's actually been re-cleared, so it's, it's really shiny, obviously. Some people think it's fake, but I kind of, you know, it's one of those pieces that everyone got to have, so. Wait, so this, do they make this anymore? They still do. So this is Gen 2. Um, they make a Gen 3 now that fits actually a lot better. Uh, it's funny because a lot of people think JDM parts fit perfect, but there's a little bit of uh, fitment issues that you have to kind of like tinker with. Uh, but they still do make this. What else did you do? I think you were mentioning that you modified so, the sunroof. This is an SI model. Um, obviously, when I got the vehicle, I wasn't exactly planning on going this far with it. Um, so with the sunroof, it's about 40, 50 pounds up top. Uh, pull that out to be able to get a little bit less weight from the top side, get center gravity down a little bit lower. And we just went with like a fiberglass plug and just wrapped on top of it. So, so how much weight did you save? From about that? 40 pounds. Yeah. That's quite a bit. Yeah, it is. With all that said, you've done so much weight savings. Are you allowed to talk about how light this thing is now? Um, without me in it and about a half tank of gas is 2,200 pounds. Um, I mean, it's light definitely compared to modern day type cars, but I, I think it can, it can drop a lot more weight as well too. So. Let's check out the engine. Yeah. Which by the way, this is the second car that I'm featuring here at my shop. Oh. First car was Ryan Literal's S15, so. Thanks. I, I, I think it's pretty cool because, because we have access to the Ben Pack lift, we can actually raise it and we can talk about things that Steve has done underneath the car to make it fast. Because this is not like a horsepower monster, right? This is not like uh, Ryan Literal's 1,000 horsepower no. S15. This is subtly built for a purpose, which is for the Optima Streetcar Challenge. So what do we have here? So this is a B18C1. Uh, so this you can actually find factory out of an Acura Integra GSR. Um, so it's a really basic motor, has type R cams, dual valve springs, uh, adjustable cam gear. So it's real minor work to kind of give it a little bit more um, reliability. Trans work is where it kind of, it, it does for us. Um, there's a 4.9 final drive in it and an OS Superlock LSD. That makes a world of a difference because you know, for those of you that do know front wheel drive cars, it's really hard to be able to put power down because the car's under steering or torque steering. And with the diff itself, it, the OS diff takes care of all that. Because once you get on throttle, you have to almost unwind the wheel because it wants to pull you into a corner, so. This has got to be so much faster than, like if this, if this was in a GSR, um, 
because of how much lighter weight this is, it's got to be so much faster. Definitely. Line. Uh, we also have a Honda S300 in it that uh, Jojo Callis tuned for me. Um, so he spent a lot of time in the mid range to, you know, give it reliability, right? We weren't chasing horsepower numbers, like you had said. We really want to be able to have that mid range type of power on this, even though it's only 170 horsepower. Uh, car revs to 8,500. So that's how much it makes to the ground, 170? Correct, correct. Yep, when we were on a uh, Mustang dyno. So I'm sure on a dyno pack, it might make a little bit more. I myself want more power, because who doesn't? Yeah. Um, so there's some talks about maybe adding nitrous into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. HPS intake, we're good friends with those guys. You got the Optima yellow top battery. I, it always blows my mind how small a radiator is on Hondas. It's just so crazy to me that it's, like half of the front here. I have so many friends of mine that ask me why I don't want to run a full radiator. Um, and I haven't had any issues with the single. Um, granted, this is an aluminum aftermarket, um, but I typically don't have any hit, hit issues. Uh, the one time I did have a little bit of rise in, in temperature was when I was in Utah and ambient temps were like at 115. Um, Plus it's a lot higher elevation. A lot higher elevation. Yeah. And so when I ran at Utah Motorsports Campus, that's when I noticed a little bit of a rise in temperature, but like one cool down lap and it's fine. So, so what year is this EG? Uh, 1993. Okay. Yeah. And did it start life as a runner, like a street car? So funny story with that is that this has been in a, my group of friends for quite some time. So in the early 2000s, um, I went with a buddy of mine to look at this chassis because I used to work at a body shop. He said, hey, can you check this out for me? Make sure it's straight and all that good stuff. So I went with him and you know, the car was cherry. He purchased it. It sat in his backyard for eight years. And then another buddy of mine went and got and put the motor into it. And he's kind of big into like M cars. So this kind of was an afterthought. And I said, hey dude, I, I want to get a track car. Let me get it. So from the initial time I actually looked at this chassis, it's been about 15, 16 years and I've had it for about five, so. Obviously, I, I went with the Sparco Evo L seats here and the Sparco safety harnesses. This is uh, Hans for when I'm at the track to keep me safe. Uh, did a little bit of a car show type touch to it by getting the pads here done in uh, microfiber suede. So this kind of gives a little bit more of those car show type feel. Went ahead with this suede headliner. Uh, I have an Imer Engineering four point roll bar that's in here as well too, super tight. Uh, so it actually is, is awesome because it hugs the roof really well. So based on Optima Ultimate Streetcar Challenge rules, do you, you have to run something like this? Uh, no, actually there's a lot of people that don't necessarily run roll bars, but you know, with me coming from a motorsports type background, I, I wanna at least get to a bolt-in roll bar in to be able to have the harnesses secured correctly so that I can be held into the seats properly. Um, yeah, because when you're driving Big Willow in this thing, I mean, you're cornering at some pretty serious speeds with this, right? I mean, obviously, like you said, this isn't exactly a high horsepower car, but you know, uh, I come out of turn nine at Big Willow, probably doing about 110 miles an hour, uh, which I think is pretty fast for what this vehicle is. Um, obviously, it, I'd rather have the safety equipment and not need it than need and not have. Uh, right. Well, yeah. And then you read it all this stuff in suede. This is where your show car background really kind of came in handy, huh? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's one of those things I can't turn off. So I kind of nerded out and I did a sunroof delete and I went ahead and got a CX headliner. So that's why there isn't a hole here for a sunroof. And then uh, added the suede, the suede pillars as well too, so. It's so much nicer than stock. Like, so you redid all of this in yep, the same material yep, yeah. too? Yeah, so the guys at Auto Fashion in San Diego helped me out with the interior inserts because obviously I didn't have too much time, but they were able to take care of things for me there. Very cool. Yeah, and then also um, I'm running a hybrid racing short shifter. So um, it's probably hard for you to see on that side, but I could adjust the throw oh. on this from this side. Oh. And then they have a little shift plate that's pretty neat and I did a Gretti shift knob and their little it looks very OEM. Yeah, it looks it's, very it's, clean. it's cool, dude. I, I mean, this part, you yeah. know, obviously this is not, but yep. this is just cool that it, it fits within this mm -hmm. uh, area. And it's height adjustable, so it's easy for me to switch gears when I'm on, when I'm driving on track as well, too. So mm -hmm. It's all just all the little things that you've done to mm -hmm. this car to make it your own. So tell me about the rear seat delete. This looks really clean. So this is all actually uh, handmade from the guys at Auto Fashion. Um, you know, I, when I was invited to SEMA last year in 2021, I kind of went to them and gave them an idea of like, hey, I want to do a rear seat delete and then incorporate some subwoofers because, you know, who, who doesn't like to have a little bit of sound as well, too, so. Yeah, but if it were up to you, if you were competing in another series, 
or if you weren't competing in Optima, you'd probably take all this stuff out that oh. you don't need. If, right, just if, I had, if I had the chance to build another car to do track stuff and just be able to get out there and do fun stuff, I would have it fully gutted and I'd probably chop this dash in half and have a six point cage in here. So you probably have a sub 2000 pound. <laughs> Definitely. EG. I, yeah, because I don't, I wouldn't have to really abide to any rules and just, I'd be out there just to kind of have fun, dude. So mm -hmm. cool. Let's put this on the lift and talk about the suspension. Yeah, sweet. Where do you usually put it? Uh, where the, the pinch weld is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the one on the back is easy. I can see that one. Cool. Yeah, the front one's probably a little bit smashed. <laughs> Who did it? Oh, it's just a 30 year old car. This is cheating. This is the cool part about having you come to the shop because we can actually look at some of the stuff that you did underneath the car. Yeah, this is nice. I actually don't get to see this view too often because I unfortunately do not have a Ben Pack lift at my house. So, <laughs> Well, you can come over to my house anytime. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. But we just wanted to kind of see underneath it because uh, a big part of this build is the suspension and footwork. Yeah, correct. So, you know, aside from the brakes itself, everything on here is something you could purchase off the shelf. Um, I went ahead and used a lot of pro car innovation uh, parts, which is uh, which is what you see here, PCI. Okay, so this is something that's brand new that they make still right now. Yeah, correct. So this is a, a, a billet arm that actually replaces the factory arm. So this is all spherical bearings that are in here now. Um, so the spherical bearings are all serviceable. So, you know, after a certain amount of track abuse, you can actually replace those, so. And they, they make this too, or is this someone so else? So this is uh, an ASR subframe <laughs> brace. Mm -hmm. uh, so because the vehicle is so old and I'm running a, a 25 mil Eibach rear sway bar, a lot of times there's such articulation while you're driving on track that the aggressiveness of the sway bar actually rips the subframe. Oh. Uh, so this is actually a, a subframe brace that actually assists in, in reinforcing that, so. Hmm. Yeah. Look, let's take a look at the front. So, all right, and you have yeah. some other stuff so here So this too. is a SPC tow links uh, to be able to have adjustability on the tow, obviously. Uh, the trailer arm bushings are actually from PCI as well too. So this has seen some track abuse, so it needs to be, uh, you know, reconditioned. Um, front side here as well is I have a 26 mil Eibach front toy. Um, a lot of front wheel drives guys usually use just a factor say bar, they disconnect it all together. Um, I feel like the front sway helps me quite a bit with rotating the vehicle, so that's there. Again, uh, PCI front lower arm. So this actually helps with caster. Um, the factory vehicle itself is about 1.6. Um, ideally, you want to be at about four degrees. So with this lower arm piece that PCI makes, it actually brings me closer to four. So I'm at about 3.8, 3.9. So that helps with steering quite a bit. Uh, you really get a sense of how big these brakes are from the back here. Yeah, um, especially for this Honda, most people use twin blocks and the monoblock is definitely being extra. Uh, okay, so then this knuckle, this, so you did a five log conversion, what is this off of? So the knuckle itself is actually um, Integra knuckle. Mm, what I did was I went with the Carceps uh, hub, which is built for the Integra knuckle itself. Um, and then it actually, upgrades the axle from a 32 millimeter nut to a 36 millimeter nut. So the axle is actually able to handle a little bit more abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is not a stock axle then? No, it's not. So it's actually adapted off of uh, RSX Type S. Uh, so what I do is you can get this off the shelf. It goes left to right, right to left. Um, because obviously some of the 32 mil, especially with the grip of the AO52, is oftentimes you're snapping axles and stuff like that because you're putting so much load in corners. Oh yeah, okay, so you recently switched to Yokohama AO52s. These are pretty much like the Cheater Street tires. Uh, yeah, so it's a 200 treadwear tire. Um, this is something that I think people run when they want to chase personal bests and some type of lap records. Um, I've obviously been accustomed to a different tire, so this is, my first time running this was at Grid Life a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's been great. Um, yeah, I love these, so I run them on this car, the 240Z, but we also run them on the A90 Supra Chase vehicle. Nice. And one of the things that I always say, at least that I have to my advantage when I'm chasing these drift cars that have three times more horsepower, is that I can outgrip them, right? So I can out-tire them, 
because I'm running um, a stickier street tire, mm -hmm. that and I'm also not drifting. Yeah, I can actually out brake them and out corner them, yeah. but I can't out accelerate them. Right? Yeah, but you're able to put the power down the ground when you need to, right? While I, they're, I try. they're slipping, we so. try, <laughs> <laughs> we try our best. But uh, one of the biggest talking points, I guess, I wanted to highlight is the fact that you're running KW suspension. A German suspension company made in Fichtenberg, Germany, <laughs> for a Japanese car. It's the Axis Powers. So uh, these are the KW V3s. So they're rebound adjustable and uh, compression adjustable. And you know, for those of you that that have seen his episode of him go visiting KW, is KW actually started with Hondas. Um, so for me, we will follow the history of the company and be able to, be able to run the product is great because it's something that I think not a lot of people were familiar with because they're so used to seeing them on European and German type cars. Yeah, they actually had a Accord wagon touring car. Yep. They have an Accord, they had a Civic, and obviously uh, Chris Marion's livery paid tribute to one of the race cars as well too. So. Yeah, it's super cool. When we went to KW in Germany, the whole process of just starting with a tube of metal, and then by the end of the assembly line, it turns into that. I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty neat too, and, and be able to have rebound and compression adjustment on a 30 plus year old vehicle, it helps quite a bit to build tune the suspension too, so. I also noticed you have some Type S underglow here. Well, this is a Honda after all. Well, you know, with me growing up in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, and obviously the vehicle looks pretty ricer in terms of what people call it, um, I had to do the underglow, right? Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. And, well, uh, because you never know if there's um, like a big rig full of VCRs that you need to. And they're actually green too. <laughs> so that you need to... we played right into that, right? <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, yeah we love Type S and uh, they love what we do here on my YouTube channel. So we love supporting them. Uh, you know, obviously cooling helps with, we have the HPS hoses here as well mm -hmm. too, so Hung over there is a really good friend of mine as well as yours, and he set me up with some of that stuff. I have DC 4 to 1 headers here, mm -hmm. and uh, skid plate because obviously if you're not going off track, that means you're not driving hard enough, so that's why that's there. Uh, and you've hit it a couple times. Yeah, like. obviously there's it seems some abuse and some gravel. Um, and then the exhaust here is custom made by Chris over at Imer Engineering, so it's two and a half all the way back. We went with a high flow CAD resonator, and then it goes into the uh, red exhaust here, and we went a little bit fancy and did a V-band so that if I ever want to just run a straight pipe, I can just change it out too, so. Mm, very yeah. cool. It's all the little things, you know, this, this is the obtainable build. Mm -hmm. This is what I like about this. This is not, this is still a SEMA car, but it's not one where it's completely just off the wall, you know, all wheel drive, two motor setup or something. It's something that uh, anybody who works hard enough can obtain, and I think that is super cool. And you know, I, I, a big thing for me is, you know, is, this isn't the most perfect vehicle out there. It's not the fastest car, but it definitely, every time you see me get out of it, I have a smile from ear to ear, so. Yeah, um, because you get to push this 10 tenths. Anytime you go out on track, you're actually pushing the limit of this car. Correct, and I think the cool part is, you know, with, with a lot of us getting a little bit older, um, just the nostalgic factor of the vehicle build itself, it brings a lot of smiles to people's faces. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if, if I can bring a smile to someone's face, uh, and I know I'm super happy with the build, then, you know, that's all that really matters, dude. Awesome, very cool. If you guys like this, and you like other episodes that we've done, definitely check out my print store, LarryChenPrints.com pick up a print for yourself, for your wall, or for your garage. I sign all of them, I print all of them. Actually, I have one of my printers here, look at this. So this is the newest one, Pro 6100, five feet long. So keep an eye out for really large prints that I'm gonna do soon. I'm gonna do canvas. I'm gonna do some five by five feet squares. I think that'll be a lot of fun.